you'd sort of have to be a fool to interact with that many agents and not see trends. It's kind of like a punch in the nose there, Nikki. As a team leader, I think although it can be one of the hardest jobs, it's also one of the most important. Okay, so how does that actually work? Everybody has bought and sold. I'm like, really? Everybody? Everybody you know has bought and sold? But there's no magic to it. It's really just consistency over time. Now, I, I was, I'm lucky enough to know a little bit about your story, only because I'm a fan of the NFL, which is where you got your start. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when I was in high school, I wrote for the like local newspaper that nobody reads, except my mom. Same thing, uh, you know, for, for you and your TV show, your mom and my mom read, watched your show and read my newspaper articles. And, uh, and so I was writing for sports because nobody else wanted to do it. And I have always really enjoyed, uh, I was writing about all different types of sports, football, basketball, baseball, soccer, everything, everything the school did basically. And, uh, and then we started, uh, you know, covering the, the games live. So I would go onto the sideline um, and we had a really amazing football team at Westlake High School in California. And we had a really amazing uh, football team. And so I would be on the sideline. I'd be writing about, you know, what I saw and what I was going to report on that night for, you know, Friday Night Football. And, uh, and you know, one day uh, someone who was doing a local network came up to me and said, hey, have you ever thought about broadcast journalism? And I didn't really know what that was. Like, I didn't, I didn't know, you know, uh, that you could do what I did in writing on TV. I'd never really explored that. And so he said, you, sh you should think about it. We have a local radio show. Uh, you know, you could do some sign line reporting. It'd be really fun for you. You'd be great at it. And so I basically took everything I was doing for my newspaper and I started doing it um, for this, you know, again, really small local uh, local radio show. And then I took that with me to college. I thought that's what I wanted to do for a living and sort of by a, a stroke of luck, luck got internships that led to jobs working in. Uh, you know, the, the big stage, so to speak, while I was still in college. So I got to cover NFL games, MLB games, NBA games, and, uh, and you know, was doing sideline reporting for, for these huge teams and national networks. And then, uh, you know, as I started to move forward in that career, like I said, all, all of this while I was between the ages of like 18 and 20 years old, which is just a really really special experience, right, um, for, for someone that young to be able to get to do something like that. And, and I looked up and said, you know, I'd always dreamed of investing in real estate. Like, I don't know why, but I was that weird kid who, when I was like 15 years old, I was like, I'm going to invest in real estate. That's really what I want to do. And, you know, I come from a family of entrepreneurs and, and that's the path I knew I wanted to take. And, and in short, the non-eloquent way to put it was I looked up and was like, I'm not making any money doing this. And I don't really see a runway for when I'm going to make some money doing this. So I don't think I'm going to do this anymore. So I got the experience, which was amazing um, because it taught me how to talk to people and how to ask the, ask the right questions and get people to communicate with me. And I said, uh, you know, I went to the library one day and I pulled some books off the shelf of a bunch of people who had made a lot of money and they all had one thing in common and it was real estate. So I thought, huh, I could do that. I'm going to go, I'm going to go do that. And so uh, I got a dual major in finance and from there I graduated and started in real estate development and, and then went forward from there. So I, I love that, by the way, and, I, and I, I still believe that when you look up today, residential and commercial real estate, new construction, you name the segment, still offers the greatest opportunity the world has ever known for the entrepreneur that has yes. unlimited mindset. That, yes. That's what I believe. Yes, absolutely. So how, how do you end up at Keller Williams? And specifically, is there a human? Is it a model? Is it, do, do you end up, how, how do you get here? Yeah. So I was in Southern California uh, still at the time when I graduated college and went into real estate development. And all I wanted to do there was become a partner in a firm. Like that's in development, really how you make money. And again, I had this theme where I just by a stroke of luck and knocking on enough doors, I found a position with a company that was uh, that was really just a startup. It was very early on. And I started with them right out of college and I was an underwriter for deals. Um, and you and I know what that is, but for anyone who doesn't know what that is, you're literally just penciling numbers all day. Like that's, that's your job. You pencil out deals to see if, if they would make sense as an investment. And, uh, and two days after I got offered partnership at that firm, my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, um, uh, got transferred to Northern California and his job. 
And I thought, well, I like him, so I'm, I'm going to go with, um, because he said, I'm definitely going. And, uh, and so we moved to Northern California, and I thought, well, what am I going to do now? I have to completely start over. So I either go and do that at a development firm, or I figure out another path. And again, I sort of kept going back to this theme of my, my goal was just to invest in real estate. That's really what I wanted to do. And so I started at another, uh, I got my license and started at another firm, which shall not be named. Um, and I walked into the manager and I said, I said, you know, I, I want to sell 12 houses this year. That's my goal. And she said, uh, oh, honey, you're, you're not going to do that. Uh, oh. you, uh, you're brand new here. You're, you know, you're 22 years old. You're, you're not going to be able to do that, but you could learn, you know, you could just shadow someone and, and, and learn. And I said, well, this isn't the place for me. And it just so happened that I was at coffee later that day and, uh, and a woman walked up to me and we, we just started chatting and she was a real estate agent. So I started asking her questions. I recognized her name and she said, well, have you ever thought about Keller Williams? And I had never heard of them before. So I went in literally that day, it was right by her office. And I went in and interviewed with the, with the team leader there and said, this is definitely the place for me. And, and I started and I did all the new agent things. This was back in like original Ignite, original productivity coaching. And I was the type of agent that just said, point me north, like someone tell me what to do and I will do and I will go and do that. And uh, in my first year in real estate, I think I door knocked, uh, I still have uh, my 411 sheet, my lead gen sheet. And I door knocked 354 days that year. I only took days off because I got married. And I did not, in fact, sell 12 houses that year. I, I think I only sold three. But my next year, I was the top individual agent in the office. And then the year after that, I started building my team and uh, all, all sort of the domino effect of doing the right things, right? That, that we see in real estate all the time. It doesn't always happen when we want it. I love that. So wh why do you end up becoming a team leader? Because you, you, you're running this successful business and then you look up and decide, okay, market center leadership, that's something I'm interested in. What's that path? Yeah. I mean, the evolution of all of this is related. And, and I remember I had a distinct moment as an individual agent. I went into my team leader one day and at the time, this was like right when we were starting to do, right when Keller Williams was starting to put out some of these amazing classes about career visioning and how to hire the right talent and how to build infrastructure inside the business, right? I was deep into the MRA models. And I sort of looked up and said, I don't want to do any of this. Like, I don't, I don't want to learn it. I don't want to do it. And I went into my team leader and said, hey, I got, I, I got a problem. This is all great. I really appreciate you explaining all of this to me and putting me in these classes and all of that. Um, but I don't want to do any of this. Someone before me has figured all of this out. And I would really prefer not to refigure it out. Even with the roadmap, I really don't want to do it. I, because I, I, can, I saw the writing on the wall. It's going to take time and money and energy, even, even if I have a faster path to follow. But of course, at the time, that didn't exist, right? So it was either like join a team or figure it out yourself or don't figure it out and suffer the pain there too. So I started building it out myself and then looked up and said, well, I want to go even faster than I can go right now because one of the biggest challenges in California is that our unit count is, is fairly low in, in relation to obviously our volume. The biggest businesses here might be doing half or a quarter of the units of a lot of the other businesses in the country. And so with that, it makes it really hard to build out infrastructure. I know like everyone who is in other markets is like Crimea River, we don't feel bad for you. And yet when, when, you're, when you're building out infrastructure and true systems that scale, it can be hard to do it from here because we just don't have the unit count until you're much, much later in the business, right? You can, uh, you know, when I was selling as an individual agent upwards of, you know, 20 to 25 million, that was like, you know, it was only like 20 houses, right? Um, so you don't have to have great systems and infrastructure in place to sell 20 houses. I looked up and said, well, how do I learn how to do this faster and on a bigger scale? And it just so happened that at the time I was still in Northern California and I really wanted to come back to Southern California. And as, as the universe goes, when we ask, um, I met my OP there, uh, when, my OP for when I was a team leader, Rick Cunningham. And he said, hey, I need a team leader at Santa Monica, which is at the time was the largest real estate company in LA. And they were had about 400 agents. They were doing just over 1.5 billion in sales volume a year. And he said, I, I need someone who understands how to do this. And I need someone who can, uh, who can learn as they go to be able to scale it even bigger because it was already a big ship. And so I said, that sounds like the right job for me. And, and so I moved back to Southern California and I took that position. And uh, in the three years that I was there, we increased profitability by over 200 percent. We increased it. They had record. Uh, we had record uh, recruiting numbers while I was there, increased the agent count from the time that I took over. I think it was a uh, 150 percent by the time I left. So it was uh, we, we did what we came there to do. And 
Uh, I always say as a team leader, I think to me, although it can be one of the hardest jobs in, in our ecosystem, it's also one of the most important because it's really getting your PhD in agent behavior and in, uh, in real estate and what happens in the market and how to coach, how to build businesses, uh, how to understand you know different behavioral styles and coaching styles and how to teach agents how to execute what it is that they're trying to execute or find the right solutions therein. And so I really realized that as, as a team leader, and I always say you, you'd sort of have to be a fool to not to interact with that many agents and not see trends, right? And one of the trends that I saw coming up was that I had a lot of agents who were a lot like me and would come to me and say, Nikki, I don't, I don't really want to join the team, um, but I need help with infrastructure. And frankly, I don't really want to build it. I don't really have the time to build it. And at the time, I didn't really have anything to offer them. And that broke my heart because I really came from a place of service and wanting to help them. And they didn't understand how to take all these pieces and put them together in a way that was cohesive. And so uh, that's really where the idea for the Lead Syndicate, which is our leverage platform, was born because I looked up and said, these agents are a lot like me when I w was an individual agent and they need help a lot like I did when I was an individual agent and what they're looking for doesn't exist yet. And so I went out and built it. And, and I love that. The, the Lead Syndicate, for those of you all that don't know, is... Uh, it's an organization that's powering market centers by bringing a platform for real estate agents where they actually help market in those agents' names while providing a ridiculously high level of support and leads. I, I, I tried to get it in a sentence, Nikki. Did I get it right? Perfectly said. I couldn't have done it better myself. Awesome. So here's what I want to know. I want to know, as you start doing this, what is the one or two things that you started doing for real estate agents at scale that they absolutely loved? And what's the one or two models and systems that are allowing them to go make more money with you than without you? The one that I can't name, I'll give you some real tactical ones that anyone could go out and build or use. But the one that I can't name is that I released them from the pressure of being able to admit that they just needed help and didn't want to be the one to put it together. Because I think to an extent, there was this whole group of agents who were raising their hands saying, we need help. And I always say to, to my own team, if we have a problem, I always say, they, they'll come to me and say, Nikki, we have a problem, whatever it is. And I say, how would you like to pay? And what I mean by that is we always have three options whenever we're, whenever we're pro you know, posed with an issue or a challenge or a problem or a system that's broken. We have three options in how we would like to pay. The first option is we do it ourselves right? That's option number one. We do it ourselves. And the benefit of we do it ourselves is that no one can ever take the knowledge away from us, right? If I learn how to fix this, or I learn how to build this, or I learn how, how to create this, no one can ever take that away from me. That's experience, right? It's why we will pay for, to bring on someone into our organization who's already done something before, right? So if uh, the first way to pay is that we do it. The challenge with that way, though, is that it tends to move a lot slower, right? You would agree that if I'm trying to figure it all out, on my own, even even with models, even with the MREA, even with coaching and classes, it's going to go faster than if I just jumped onto someone else's rocket ship that was already doing it. So the first way, benefit is you get to keep the knowledge. Downside is it's going to go slower. The second way to pay, and what I always say to them, is we could hire somebody to come in and do this, right? We could hire someone who already knows what they're doing, and they could come in and resolve this problem for us with all of the knowledge they're in. Right? They could bring their experience, they could bring their knowledge, and they could probably fix this or resolve this or build this much, much faster than we can. But the challenge in any organization is that if we pay for that, well, then we have to hold expenses accountable somewhere else, right? If we spend money here, then we have less money to spend elsewhere. And where this comes up in most agents' businesses is they'll leverage a platform or they'll leverage a team or they'll join a team or they'll hire an assistant or whatever that looks like. And then they don't use the time that they've gotten back wisely, i.e. prospecting. And then they say, oh, told you it wasn't going to work. So that's the challenge that most agents face. And the, the benefit to that option is that it goes faster. And the downside is that it, obvi uh, is that it obviously costs something. And then you always have the third option, of course, which is you do nothing and then you suffer, suffer the consequences therein. So, uh, you know, but you always have to pay one way. So I, whenever I, we have a problem, I look at my team and I say, how would you like to pay? You want us to do it? You want to pay somebody else to do it? Or do you want to do nothing at all? And we'll pay for that later. But we always have to pay somehow. Ladies and gentlemen, we just had our first model moment of this interview. This is that time when you pull out a pen. How would you like to pay? Option number one, we figured out ourselves. This is gonna be slow, but we're gonna know how to do it. No one can take it away from you. Option number two, we hire someone that already knows how to do it, but that's gonna cost money, although it's gonna go faster. We may have an expense problem. And option number three, which is the one that you always have in life, is you do nothing and you just stay in pain. Nikki, I love the focusing question. 
So how does that yeah. end up leading into a business? Right. So then I went to agents and I said, how would you like to pay? Right. You, by the way, I'm giving you permission to stay where you are, but just make peace with the fact that it's going to be painful. And then I'm also giving you permission to do it yourself. But the truth is that we're having this conversation. You've been here for three years or four years or five years where you're like, this is the year I'm going to get my database together. No, you're not. You would have done it by now. Right. So then the, the, then the only option you have less is left is option number two. But then I just tell them if you're going to go with option number two, then you actually have to use the time that you get back to call more people, talk to more people, create a better client experience. So that's the intangible, right? That's the one that I can't really say this is a model. And yet we've given them permission to decide how they want to pay. And then we hold them accountable to whichever decision they've chosen, right? So if it's option number two, we say, well, you have all this leverage now, use it, go out there and talk to more people because that's the goal. The other way that or some of the other models that we're providing that I think have allowed not only the expansion, but for the agents to move quickly is that we do it under their brand. So there's not, we don't have the, the ego pull of like, this is, you know, you're, you're taking over my business. I'm, this is no longer my database. This is no longer my experience. Uh, the client's none the wiser, right? We we're just there to make them look good. And that's how we, and that's how we behave inside their business. We're there to be infrastructure. We're there to make them look good. Okay. So how does that actually work? So let, let's say that I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the syndicate. I have uh, 150 people in my sphere of influence. H how are you marketing in my name? Like, are, are you making the smart plans? Are you doing all of this? Yeah, we do all of it. So we have a system where, and as long as they, all they need to know how to do is add somebody to their database. And assuming they can do that, and uh, with our plans, they'll get a minimum of 40 touches a year, everybody in their database. They still have to call their database, but we'll automatically touch that database at least 40 times a year. And, you, and which, what piece of technology are you using to do all this? Command. So you're, you're using it all, all over the place. You're doing it in their brand. So ostensibly, the, the, the agents in your world still feel like they have ownership of their data bank. They actually do. You're kind of betting on people do business with people they like. They already like these people. So I would be crazy not to market in their names. Yeah, I mean, I'm floored how many agents I talk to. And the first question I ask anyone in an agent interview is how many people do you have in your database? And the numbers aren't small. I mean, a lot of times we only work with individual agents. We don't take on teams. So it's specifically individual agents that we focus on. And sometimes the numbers are 400, 600, 1,000, 3,000, 4,000. And then I get to the next most logical question, which is, well, how much business are you getting out of that database? And they're like, well, none. Uh, everybody has bought and sold. I'm like, really? Everybody? Everybody you know has bought? and sold. And then I asked the next most logical question, which is, well, how often are you communicating with them? And then we usually, you know, run around for a little while while they tell me all the ways that they want to communicate with them, but haven't. And then we really get down to, it might be a couple touches a year. And you and I both know that the models are out there for us to know that even if people know, like, and trust us, trust us, if we don't communicate with them consistently, they won't think of us when they think of real estate. So we come into their database and we make their people think of them when they think of real estate. And last year of the volume that we did in our first year and sort of our, our, I mean, we're still figuring it out. It's a newer model. And last year in our true, you know, first year of business and really figure it out out time, um, about 20% of the agent's production in our uh, on our platform came from our database management, us mining leads that they already had. I absolutely love that. Is there any one touch or two touches out of the 40 that are an absolute no-brainer that if I'm not doing, I need to be doing tomorrow? Or is it just a matter of do something 40 times a year? Just do something. I don't think, I, everybody asks this, and I know I'm sure you get asked this too. It's like, what's I, I love this when someone's talking about scripts. You're like, hey, I have this person who's not ready to buy. They don't don't have any money, their credit, their credit score is low, and they just moved here and they might move away in a year. Uh, how do I get them to buy a house? And I'm like, you don't. <laughs> you just, I don't have a magic script for you. They're just not ready. Go talk to more people and find somebody who is, right? And I think it's the same for those touches. The, the truth is there's no magic touch. Um, I have definitely some scripts and touches that work better than others, but there's no magic to it. It's really just consistency over time. Cool. Okay. So number one, I got to be marketing to my sphere of influence. I got to do at least 40 touches per year. Year, and I'm guessing this is a mix. Is, it, is this email, text in a TCPA friendly compliant way and then phone in a friendly TCPA way? 
Yes. And we actually give the agent options about how automated they want to be. So some of our agents have no automation, meaning they personally make all the touches um, and we hold them accountable to that. Some of them have partial automation where it's just email, no text. Some of them have full. So they have options. And yes, it's all, all of the above that you just said in the in the TCPA compliant way. I love that. Okay, cool. So if 20% of your business is coming directly from the database management that you're doing for the agents, that implies that 80% of your business is coming from something else. What is that thing? About 25, 20 to 25% is coming from our lead generation that we bring in. And the rest is, is a mix of their lead generation, them mining, uh, you know, additional leads through their lead generation levers, whatever that looks like. Okay. Well then talk to me about the 25% coming from your lead generation. What, what's the source? So there's not one. Um, I don't think we can ever only have one source in order to convert those leads because in every location, one of the biggest challenges that we faced up front was if you know how to do lead generation in one location, it does not imply that you know how to do lead generation in all locations. And I certainly uh, learned that lesson very quickly in what we do. So there's a number of different uh, a dif a different sources that we bring in. In total, across all of our markets, we probably have close to 20 different sources that we bring in. Some of them are online. Some of them are Opsidy or Zillow Flex style, wherein you're paying a percentage off the top. Um, a lot of that is agent referrals from, from our network now getting bigger. Um, so there's a number of different places that those come in from. ISAs that, that we have that are calling through uh, through the leads that we already receive or outbound, outbound calls in a compliant way. All of those are sources that bring in leads. Cool. In the next three minutes, make me richer. I'm going to sit with a pen and a sheet of paper. I need you to give me a model or a system that I can walk off of this interview with and go put in place in my life and make more money. The, the fastest way to do that, Jason, is I would take you through how you'd like to pay right? Like first I have to know that. Are you willing to do it? Are you willing to do the activities? Because if you're an agent looking at me and you're an individual agent and you're getting to the, to the ceiling of achievement, wherein you've hit your maximum, by the way, that's different for every agent. Sometimes that's going to be 5 million. Sometimes it's 10, sometimes it's 12. Sometimes you'll make it all the way up to 20. You'll be losing your ever loving mind and you don't see your family. You don't see your friends, but you're selling tons of houses and we're all cheering for you, but you hate your life, right? So wherever you're at in that journey, I'm going to ask you, how would you like to pay? Because you, you have to figure this out somewhere and and you have to make peace with the fact that you're going to have to figure it out on your own if you choose option number one. And, and if you do that, then I would say go directly to MAPS, find the best coach that you can find to help you build infrastructure, take you from the beginning, get into career visioning, read the millionaire real estate agent once, then do it again and again and again and again and again and start to build some infrastructure inside your business. But if you know, if you can have an authentic conversation with yourself and say, you know what, I've spent six years saying the same thing that I'm going to, this is the year I'm going to do it and I still haven't done it, I can make peace with the fact that I just don't want to do it. Well, then I would say you need to pick option number two and then decide from there which of these amazing platforms that are available to you inside Keller Williams is right for you, right? Then just go on some interviews and figure out who feels like the best fit and who's going to provide you the best infrastructure for your business. Or make peace with the fact that your option is number three and you're going to do nothing and you're going to keep complaining about it and you're going to stay where you are. It's kind of like a punch in the nose there, Nikki. Like, that, that's some tough talk. I mean, at the end of the day, like, I was waiting for you to be like, you buy internet leads, make sure you contact them in five minutes, but you kind of went existential on me, and th that's a really big question. It sounds like that's a focusing question that you use for your whole life. In everything that I do, because here's what I've made peace with in building and running a big business. I, I had a great conversation yesterday with my coach and, and he asked me, he said, what are you going to do when you're at 200 locations? He's like, Every, everything might work right now. Or what are you going to do when you're at 500 agents? He's like, yeah, this is all great. And you're figuring it out as you go. And I said, well, to me, f figuring out solutions for five agents is not a whole lot different than figuring out solutions for 50 or figuring out solutions for 500 or 500,000. The principles are the same, right? I always say if you're if you're building a house, then the principles of building a house versus building a sky rise are not all that different. If you're building the sky rise, yeah, your foundation has to go deeper. You're going to need more material, better technology, more people, but the base principles aren't all that different. And I think solving any problem in your business is exactly the same or in your life. I love this idea that you have a coach. Is that now, is this what you went on a quest throughout the world and wandered through the desert until you found one? Or did one show up in your life? A little bit of both. I, I, you know, I was on a quest. I think 
the, the beauty of coaching and the beauty of a great coach, like I've had a number of coaches fire me and say like, hey, you're, you're past where I'm the right fit for you. Time, time for you to go find somebody else. And I had that early on when I was building out the lead syndicate and I had, you know, a coach I'd been with for years say like, you're, pa- you're past the point that I'm the right fit for you. Go, go forth and find someone else. And so I went on that quest and found someone who, who could just ask me the right questions to guide me forward, right? Um, you know, it's hard when you're not really modeling after anything. A lot of my infrastructure I can model. It's not you know, so, so dissimilar from a team or an expansion team, but a lot of what we're doing is new and the problems we were solving were new. And so I needed someone to hold me accountable to not feeling sorry for myself uh, when I was solving the big problems that I totally wrote, you know, I raised my hand and said, I'd like to be the person to solve this. And I needed the, you know, the coach who was going to be able to be my mirror and say, you decided to be here. You chose option number one, uh, stick with option number one, right? I love that. There's a pattern that I see with almost everybody that I'm lucky enough to speak with. They all have coaches. If you don't have one, get a hold of maps, figure it out. But the fact of the matter is, yeah. even the best players in the world play better and win more championships when they have a coach in their corner. Nikki, what are yeah. you reading right now? What are you listening to podcast? What documentaries are you watching? And what are you watching on Netflix? Uh, so right now I'm reading A Beautiful Constraint, which if you haven't read is a, a great book. It was actually referred to me by uh, by Carl Lieber. And and really has helped to put into perspective just the just the way we approach problems, right? Just the the, the mentality through which we approach problems or, or challenges or breaks in systems or whatever. Uh, which, if you're running a big business, I would say that that's probably a good eighty percent of your job, right? When you walk into the door every day. Um, I'm also uh, also reading, at, well, rather I should say, I'm listening to Masters of Scale, which has been really powerful for me. Why? For me, it's all perspective. I think when you're when you're building a business of any size, you sort of get into this vacuum. And I have the privilege of knowing people like you and some of my other incredible friends that are running big businesses in Keller Williams that I can call them and say like, I'm ha- uh, I'm struggling. And and yet, uh, reading something like that helps you to understand that all the businesses of all sizes and success levels, there's sort of this uh, there's sort of this evolution that that the team goes through, where and you feel like you're in a vacuum, right? Like you feel. Like you're trying to figure this all out by yourself. And then when you read something like that, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going through the same iteration that every great entrepreneur before me has gone through. So I'm just going to st- stick it out and learn from the people who came before me and, and just know that I'm in this period of this iteration, right? Or that I need to ask these different questions or take a step back and look at it from this perspective. So those types of books really help me. Perspective is an important thing for me. I love it. Nikki, at the end of every one of these interviews, I try to name it. But the name only works if you agree to it. So if you hate it, you got to tell me. But I got to tell you, I think we call this one a question for all entrepreneurs. How would you like to pay? Yeah, I love it. We got a name. Ladies and gentlemen, the entrepreneur is Nikki Miller. The company is the lead syndicate. The model is the question. How would you like to pay? You only have three options. We hope you make the right one. And there's no wrong one. You do you. Nikki, thanks for joining us. Grab the mouse and just click here. I know you want more of these.